name for a bus you can imagine this year because <laughs> search for Gen Z on the internet. I can assure you, you won't find anything about hardware anytime soon. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is some work that was, uh, um, came out of um, some research, uh, research at HPE that we uh, did a long time ago called The Machine. Uh, we started coming up with a new interconnect uh, between a new system interconnect for that project. It uh, was designed to do some different things. So I'm going to talk about what it is. Um, I'm going to talk about why I think you might find it interesting uh, in terms of how it's different from existing technologies and what kind of capabilities it's going to bring to our systems. Um, then I'm going to talk about, uh, at the end, I'll talk about the development work we're doing uh, to bring it into Linux. Uh, we're, we're obviously starting the work very early. Uh, the hardware, the specification, uh, Gen Z specification 1.0 was, uh, was finished up last year. Um, we're starting to, see, uh, starting to see silicon designs in our company and other companies. Um, the, consor the Gen Z consortium is a broad industry consortium. Um, as with any new hardware uh, initiative, if you've been in this industry for a while, you know that a lot of vendors will pile on into a new consortium in the hopes that they won't miss out on something, um, which, is, which is true of Gen Z as well. Um, we, we have a, an enormous number of members in the consortium right now, but it's starting to gain a little more traction with the members. We're starting to get a little more collaboration with the con within the consortium with people coming back and saying, you know, that part of the spec isn't really what we want. Can we do it this other way instead? So we're starting to see the kind of collaboration that you want to see in a consortium. Um, so it's a system interconnect, and that's kind of a broad class of things, uh, USB, uh, RS-232, Ethernet, uh, PCI, those are all system interconnects, things that connect bits of the system together. Gen Z is kind of does everything. It's a really big specification. Um, it's, supposed to be, uh, it's supposed to be very general purpose. It's supposed to go from everything from an intranode connection where you're connecting a CPU to memory all the way to uh, spanning an entire data center. So imagine uh, imagine being able to uh, construct the, uh, effectively construct a data center scale computer with a single interconnect, and that's what Gen Z can do. Um, its fundamental operation is a load store operation. It is not a packet transferring system. It's not a DMA transferring system. It's a, it, the fundamental operation it provides is literally fetching and storing a collection of bytes. And so in that it looks a lot like PCIe. Uh, where the configuration of the system is done by loading and storing data from uh, configuration registers, um, even across the data center. So it's, it looks a little like PCIe. Um, it also, of course, has additional operations that, have, uh, the, that look a lot like uh, packet transfers, so you can actually transfer packets with it. Um, you can map, if your system allows it, of course, you can take this load store semantic on the Gen Z and just map, the, map that directly to load store operations from the processor. Uh, so whereas in, uh, whereas in an Ethernet system or an InfiniBand system, you have to do an OS, transform uh, an OS transfer uh, to go do some operations on that bus to get data transferred across that bus, with a Gen Z system, you can take a remote, ad uh, remote chunk of memory from a remote machine, uh, map it into your local address space, and do loads and stores directly. Um, it's packet switched. Uh, so unlike PC PCIe, uh, where you have a very fixed topology, uh, Gen Z is packet switched. You can hot plug things, you can have routers, you can do switches, you can do all kinds of craziness. Um, it supports multipath. The, the reason that multipath is in the Gen Z specification is for, is for rapid failover. If you have one part of the, one part of the fabric fail, uh, the system can be configured to automatically fail over to another, another route. So you can actually get some redundancy in the system um, and some reliability. Uh, let's see. Uh, one of the things that Gen Z can actually do is, is a, as a low-level memory interconnect. Um, if you had uh, Gen Z in your processor natively, uh, it's actually sufficient to use that to connect to uh, memory components. Uh, so instead of having a DDR controller embedded in your processor, uh, you could actually put the DDR controller next to the DDR memory um, and then use a Gen Z protocol to your processor. Uh, this has a, uh, some, uh, some advantages over DDR. The, the number of pins you require is much lower. Uh, because you're using a serial protocol instead of a parallel protocol. It's memory technology independent. Uh, so one of the big things that would happen when, uh, when uh, we got started getting NVDIMMs in our systems is that the existing DDR standards weren't sufficient to talk to the NVDIMMs because of the way that the NVDIMMs operate. So we actually had to change the interface in the processor to memory because of the memory technology that we wanted to connect to it. Where the Gen Z-like system, ugh, it's totally independent. The memory controller is with the memory and the bus controllers with the processor. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of other advantages. Uh, you, get, you can connect a lot more memory, uh, both because you're using fewer pins on the processor 
And because Gen Z is a scalable technology, you could, you could put a switch in there if you had to and you know, star out to a million other memory nodes. Obviously, you add latency when you do kinds of th things, things like that. Uh, but it allows you to do something like put your uh, RAM very close to the processor and put your non-volatile memory a hop away uh, because the non-volatile memory is probably going to be slower from, for some time to come. So it makes your SOC independent of the memory technology you want to connect to it. It makes the amount of memory that you connect to your processor independent of your processor vendor's uh, choices and the number of DDR, a number of memory pins they offer coming out. So that's one of the things where Gen Z is kind of interesting um, from a system architecture perspective. Uh, there's a couple other reasons. Uh, it's both a bus and a network, right? We've talked about, uh, there's, I've seen other presentations where people talked about how packet switching just kind of infiltrates the entire ecosystem. Uh, we used to have serial connections to our monitors. Now we have, uh, now we have DisplayPort. Oh, it's a packet switch, a packet switch display protocol. We used to have uh, serial lines to our terminals. Now we have networking, which is packet switched. Uh, telephones used to be used to be streaming data, and now telephone systems are all packet switched. So now I'm taking pat this notion of packet switching and moving it into the fundamental part of the uh, of the of the, com of the uh, computer architecture. So the lowest level, fastest buses in your system can now be packet switched, which means you can route them, which means you can do, uh, which means you can scale them, which means you can build large systems or small systems. Um, and it offers you some uh, more control points for uh, changing the system configuration on the fly, um, and it also offers a lot of scalability. Um, it does add complexity, oddly. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, I think the Gen Z spec is, I don't remember how many pages, it's it, on the order of 1,000 or 1,500 pages for the specification. It, it's a soup to nuts kind of specification. Uh, if somebody, somebody wanted something in Gen Z um, and could convince the, uh, the architects that it was a good idea, it probably got added. Um, a lot of the stuff in Gen Z is optional, and a lot of, for instance, the notion of routing, um, if you have a point-to-point -point connection, you probably don't want to send packets, uh, packet header information that will allow routing. You probably want to sh use shorter addresses to reduce the number of bits you're sending over the stream. And so there are alternate packet formats that eliminate some of the information to make the packet smaller and the packets uh, more rapid, uh, more easily processed. Uh, let's see. Uh, a, 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 Many people have asked about the notion of the security in Gen Z. I talk about Gen Z as being both an intra-system and an and a intra, inter system interconnect. So you can imagine multiple computers being connected through a network. Right now, the way that we do security is those networks go into the operating system, and the operating system uh, secures the computer from the network, right? Effectively limits what, uh, what processes that network can get access to. But now I'm talking about a load store bus where you can literally map memory from your system into some other system's address space directly. Uh, the operating system cannot see the transactions going uh, going between uh, going on the bus at that point because it's mapped the memory uh, to the point where there's no operating system involvement. So we need to have security at a lower level in the system. We can't just expect the operating system to be able to Im implement all the security necessary. So Gen Z, the Gen Z protocol has a couple levels of security, and then the Gen Z hardware has uh, some more stuff. Uh, so the one thing that uh, HPE does a lot of is we do, is we do um, partitionable systems. So we have composable systems where you can buy an enormous rack of equipment and you can reconfigure that rack into many different systems uh, in, in a wide variety of uh, configurations. And that means that you can have a single set of equipment um, and kind of change what kind of computers you own on the fly. And that's been valuable for a lot of our customers. Um, so we've kind of introduced that same notion into Gen Z, where you can actually take Gen Z and you can just create these hard partitions using access keys. And you can say this, these three components and this pile of memory is part of this system, and this access key uh, defines this other system. And you can partition that, uh, partition the system into two pieces. And those pieces, uh, there's hardware access control, which prevents packets from the wrong access key domain from uh, being seen uh, across uh, in another access domain. So that provides a, a hardware level protection, which is good for partitioning. But if you actually want to be able to share a little bit of data, uh, then you need a more sophisticated notion. And we have something called, uh, called R keys. And the R keys actually allow, uh, actually tag the requester. And each you can have a, a, a special Gen Z MMU called a ZMMU that has these R keys in it. And the access control is actually done in the hardware. So a request for memory comes in with a specific R key. If that R key matches the R key of the page, then you can get access to that. 
So even though the, the operating system isn't involved in the individual transactions, the operating system still has control over what memory it exposes to who in the fabric. So there, there, is, uh, uh, there is quite a bit of security there. Um, so the reason I'm here today, obviously, is we want to talk about where Gen Z fits into Linux. And Gen Z fits into Linux um, in, a, in a number of different ways. Um, it's a bus, right? You can connect, I can, I can have, uh, I can imagine GPUs with a Gen Z native interface, and you just plug them into your computer using a, G a Gen Z socket, just like we use PCIe today, um, and it's gonna connect devices to the host. You could use Gen Z for memory, right? So the memory plugs in, and you want your system to be able to discover the memory and use the memory. So you need some kind of way of talking about devices on the Gen Z bus, but it's also a network. Right? So we need to be able to go out and discover other hosts of the environment. We need to be able to figure out uh, what the routing looks like, how to configure the switches. Um, so it looks a lot more like InfiniBand or Ethernet at that, in, in that way. And so it kind of does these uh, two different things. So if you look at, here's a, here's a comparison between Gen Z and a couple of existing interconnects. So you have PCIe and USB, and you can see some of the terminology that we use and how they're similar. Uh, USB is, is doesn't, have, uh, doesn't really have subnets, it just kind of has you know, a single topology. Um, but we have uh, device numbers, and we have uh, each device has a unique identity within the system. Uh, each device can expose a number of different components, so each physical device can appear as multiple virtual devices in the Gen Z environment, just like, uh, just like PCI and USB. So we use different terminology, of course, because everybody likes to make up their own terms, but the ideas are very similar to stuff we've already seen. I use USB advisedly, uh, because USB is probably the closest thing to Gen Z in terms of how it, how it, how it kind of gets managed, um, and we'll talk about that a little more, uh, a little more later. Uh, here's some more, here's operation, you know, things that you're gonna do in, in, in the system for operation. Uh, USB, PCI, and Gen Z. Again, very similar terminal, uh, very similar activities, um, uh, but they work in a little, little different way. Uh, Gen Z is a little more flexible than PCIe, where the physical topology of the system controls the routing of the data, whereas in Gen Z, you actually have the ability to go configure the switches and change how the routing works on the fly. Um, yeah, let's see. So now I want to talk about what we're going to do, uh, what we're trying to get started to do uh, Gen Z support in Linux. Uh, so our goal, uh, it's a pretty simple goal, we just want Gen Z devices to work in Linux, right? You got new hardware, you want to get it working in Linux. Um, we want it to work as kind of real Gen Z. We don't want, you know, some firmware emulation of USB or Ethernet or something. Uh, looking, making, trying to make a Gen Z device look like PCIe or USB or Ethernet or something. We really want to have Gen Z devices look like Gen Z because unless we actually expose the capabilities of Gen Z to the operating system, then applications and system, uh, system implementers aren't going to be able to take advantage of it and the value of Gen Z is kind of dissipates. Uh, so uh, we're obviously developing everything in the open. It's all on GitHub right now um, and we want to, want to, if, if there are other uh, companies working on Gen Z products, that allows us to collaborate openly with them. Um, and of course, as we develop the code, um, in subsystems that we're gonna be interacting with, we're gonna, we're gonna be hoping to get some, uh, some review and feedback about our terrible architectural decisions. Um, let's see. So the classic Linux driver stack, nothing too scary. Uh, we're gonna make another purple box, right? We're gonna make some more management stuff and another bus system. Um, and then we're gonna write some device drivers and all those device drivers for the Gen Z devices are just gonna plug into the existing Linux system. So from applications perspective, um, there's not gonna be a huge amount of change. Uh, probably the biggest change is gonna be in management. Uh, so um, if, you, if you think about PCIe and USB, uh, they're very statically managed. When you plug in a USB device, the routing to that USB device is fixed by the topology of where you plugged it in. In Gen Z, the topology is, the, topo the hardware topology is fixed, but the routing topology is defined by how you configure the switches. Um, so we're really not able to uh, statically, uh, uh, statically figure out um, what the routing should look like. Um, and when a new device comes into the system, we can't really statically decide which systems should be allowed to see that device. Um, so we're actually, we actually have a whole steaming pile of Gen Z policy that we need to implement 
in the Linux environment to kind of manage all of the, uh, the entire fabric. We need to know what devices are there and what systems should be able to see them, what address they should be assigned, and how they should get packets routed to them. Um, we could do that all in the kernel and have some static policy uh, to figure all that out. But I think we're, our current plan right now is to, is to expose enough of uh, the Gen Z control uh, mechanisms uh, through a syscall, syscall interface and do all that policy stuff, stuff up in user space. So this is kind of different from how PCIe and USB work. Um, uh, PCIe does allow some configuration from, from, uh, of the devices. You can change the addressing of the devices. But that's all kind of managed in the kernel right now. Um, and while I would like to make it all automatic and managed in the kernel, there's enough policy stuff here that I don't think it's reasonable to do so. So we're going to try, uh, try an architecture where we do this stuff up in, up in user space. And the last thing I wanted to really talk about today was uh, the emulation stuff that we're doing. Because uh, I really didn't want to talk about the details of, of how this stuff works. Um, so what we're going to do, what we're doing right now is we're building a Gen Z emulator. Um, we're using uh, QEMU and its virtual uh, and its uh, and its um, uh, intra virtual machine uh, messaging system and intra virtual machine memory stuff, uh, so we can actually simulate Gen Z at a pretty low level uh, and build our Gen Z uh, uh, fabric on top of that. So this is what this is kind of the simulator that we're building. Uh, pieces of this are up on GitHub right now. So we're going to build a Gen Z emulator that actually looks like Gen Z and takes Gen Z messages in and pretends to route them to different uh, virtual nodes in the system. Uh, we can do some emulation of routing. We can do error injection. We can do latency simulation because you can actually get packets uh, trans uh, transiting the network through different routes, and so you don't you, you don't have ordering guarantees like we do with PCIe. Um, and then we'll, our goal is to actually be able to write real code, uh, real, real Gen Z driver code that sits on top of our Gen Z infrastructure with this virtual Gen Z bridge. Um, so we can actually implement a lot of the management infrastructure and maybe a couple of the device drivers before we get hardware working. Um, and that is our current plan. And then the other nice thing we can do is we can actually, in another, uh, uh, another VM, we can actually implement a synthetic Gen Z device and it can respond to the Gen Z management and, and data messages um, like a real Gen Z device would. And so we can actually emulate both devices and hosts in this, in this cool, cool environment. So that's what we're working on. Uh, it's obviously under major construction. Um, we're just going to keep coding along. Um, we'll probably have, uh, I'm trying to get some, uh, some more architectural documents written and published so people can see what we're doing a little more closely. Um, and then as soon as we have anything that looks vaguely useful, uh, we're, we're going to be posting it for comments uh, to the list. So questions? Yeah. It's over here. Go, Russell. OK, sorry. Um, how, how does the memory latency compare to uh, traditional memory systems? Um, if it's point to point, it's about the same, but every switch that you add obviously adds additional latency. So if you want a very, if you want an enormously huge system and with a lot of switching infrastructure, it'll be, it'll be obviously slower. But if you have uh, slow point to point links, it's using the same, the same files as other systems, so latency is similar. So there's, there's no particular reason in, that, that's going to increase latency. Will, will they be doing things like having, say, two Gen Z buses on, on a, uh, on a CPU to double the uh, bandwidth and... Uh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, Kashko here, and so you didn't talk about that at all. Does <sighs> I, <laughs> I kind of glossed over that. Uh, so Gen Z itself doesn't have any native cache coherency in it. We're talking about how to kind of extend it to add that. It's kind of hard. Uh, so right now... <laughs> Yeah. So right now, actually, the systems that we're building right now are not coherent. And it's, it's, so you have your, your, your single system image, which is coherent, and then across to another system image, there is no coherence. And so we're actually using flushes and invalidates to make that kind of work. And it's kind of clunky, and we would like to figure some new other mechanism. But when you talk about a data center scale memory system, the notion of trying to do cache coherence across that is kind of daunting. But you, you said some bits can be optional, so you could have that at a small. It would step. obviously everything's optional in Gen Z, so. <laughs> Thanks.
How do you um, boot a Gen Z environment? Do you boot across the fabric? Uh, booting in a Gen Z environment? Uh, we have thought about that a little bit. Um, obviously, it's going to, uh, so uh, the, the, uh, the firmware and the device would have to do a lot of the Gen Z management on its own in order to discover the Gen Z device to boot from, and it probably will do that. Uh, so it'll work a lot like USB, where the firmware actually does, sets up the bus and gets things working to the point where you can get it booted, and then the OS takes over the bus and then re-enumerates and reconfigures everything for its own use. So that's, that's, that's how it would end up working, kind of, uh, of necessity. Uh, so one thing you mentioned was uh, hanging system memory off of Gen Z. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going and reconfiguring this and, and routing that, um, what's, where's, where, where's that running to do the routing and the et cetera while you decide there's a different way to get to your main memory? These are interesting management problems, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> In that particular case, though, because there would probably not be a switch between the processor and the memory, there'd be no routing to configure. So that would have been configured by the BIOS and we would probably leave it alone. Now it's important to realize that the routing and the addressing are separate, a separate ideas. And so just because you're changing the routing doesn't mean you're changing the addressing across the bus. And so the, the processor would still, if, if, you, if you could atomically flip the routing around, you could actually get the, the things to keep working. But I, uh, yeah, <laughs> probably not. Cool, thanks Keith. Um, just interested in some of the simple, like I can see in complex architectures where you need a lot of the routing in simpler situations, can you do, you know, how much can you leave out and can you do things like have a, a crossbar so that it, it just all the time routes for some, in, in most situations and reduces the latency? Uh, yes, you could, uh, in uh, the, the, there are actually multiple different uh, packet formats available, and one of the packet formats available is a non-routable format. So if you have a direct connected Gen Z bus, you could use a, a simpler packet format that wouldn't have any routing information, and the packets will be shorter and, and quicker to process. Yep. Neat. You didn't mention InfiniBand. Could you talk about the difference between NIST and Gen Z? I did talk about InfiniBand a little bit. So InfiniBand is, is obviously a, a very similar technology. Um, InfiniBand is very DMA-based. Uh, which, which means that you can't, do the, you can't do load stores directly from the processor in current InfiniBand systems that I'm aware of. So it's a little different. Um, and, and, and InfiniBand is also not designed to do direct memory connection and direct device access. So it, InfiniBand is kind of a subset of Gen Z in a lot of ways. So yeah, there's obviously some, obviously some, obviously some similarities there, uh, especially as we talk about the, the actual underlying hardware itself. We're going to be using very similar technologies. But I think Gen Z has uh, um, some, an interesting set of additional capabilities uh, that's going to be fun to explore. Um, where do you think this will position um, with storage? Will it become sort of an NVMe replacement or interoperate somehow? Um, we're certainly doing a lot of work with storage in the Gen Z environment. It's one of our primary targets. Um, uh, it, has some, it has some nice advantages in that you can, do, you can have a, a storage system which is shared between multiple, multiple computers and the same multiple operating system instances in the same environment. Uh, so that allows you to do some, uh, some nice sharing of resources. Um, obviously, because it gives you direct load store access, uh, just like NVMe, you can, you can, you can do... Um, uh, you could do direct access. Uh, so it has a lot of the same capabilities, but it's a, it's a lot more scalable, obviously. And I think we are. Oh. I thought you could do direct map of NV NVMe things. Not yet, huh? Oh. Well, it's better than NVMe, then. You can do load store. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. I think we have one more session this, uh, before, the, before dinner time.